Yeah, I remember when we were kids, when you were teaching at a private school, and then I think it was probably in my early teens where I first heard you talk about, you called a lesson called Cosology that you made up, and I can't remember if you just thought that it would be helpful to the kids and started to go over it, because it wasn't in the curriculum. I taught sixth grade for 12 years in a small private Christian school, and it's around that time when boys in particular began to experiment with maybe saying bad words, uh, sometimes in private or sometimes on the football field or something like that, and just sort of testing the waters. And, and there are good questions that start to come like, well, why, why is this word something we're not supposed to say? Who, who made up these rules? And I used to do a Bible lesson every day as part of my day daily uh, routine with my students. So I just decided to do a lesson on what I call cussology. And I would go into the class to and let them know that we were going to be talking about all those words that they weren't supposed to say. And, and I would look around the room and see eyes kind of get, <laughs> get wide, like, okay, where is Mr. Terrell going to take all this? So I gave it some thought and realized that some of these words uh, I would say are worse than others, uh, more serious than others. And, but they fall into different categories that can be pretty, pretty easily defined. And I've, I thought it would be real helpful for them to realize there's a reason behind all this stuff. It's not just somebody made up a list of words and said, let's all, let's say we can't say these, there's a reason for all of them. So that kind of came out of this. And, uh, this came out of that rather, uh, my little, lesson on cussology. I would say there is something that we, we call them cuss words. I grew up in East Texas and we, we call the whole lot of them, all these words we weren't supposed to say were, were called cuss words, but actually only a, a limited set of them are actually what I would say are technically curse words. And then there are words that I would say more are profanities. And we can talk about what all these mean, but just to give you the list here, and then maybe vulgarities or, or crudities, crass words. And then there are insult words of particular kinds. So those are just a few. Of the, those are the main categories that they fall into. Blasphemy kind of goes along with profanities. I just think it's an interesting topic. And it's the reason I asked you to, to talk about this is because I've never heard anybody address this as a topic. You might, yeah. you, there might be something if you're going through Exodus or something where somebody will explain what blasphemy is or, you know, the story in the New Testament where they lower the paralytic through the roof and Jesus tells him his sins are forgiven and the Pharisees say, this man's blaspheming because only God can forgive sins. Right. Yeah. I said for years I was going to write a book for youth, not older teens probably and not little children. So maybe 10 to 14 or something like that and call it cussology. I still have that in the back of my mind. So maybe someday, well, if I can, I'll start up a, a little bit uh, zoomed out on this. And before I jump into the specifics, sure. Of course, I'm coming at this from the viewpoint of, of an evangelical Christian. Evangelical Christians historically have had a high view of the, the Bible, the scriptures as the written word of God. Primarily, we have that view of the scriptures because Jesus had a very high view of the scriptures. You can look through the New Testament. He constantly said things like, have you not read when he was addressing uh, scribes and Pharisees or groups of Jewish leaders as if he expected them to have read this, read this in the Bible. And he would say things like, um, oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have said, speaking about himself as the Messiah. He, he thought that these Jewish leaders should have been able to understand who he was claiming to be the Messiah if they had really understood the Bible. And he would say things like um, when someone asked him a question about divorce, he would say, again, have you not read? how God from the beginning created them male and female. He would refer right back to the early chapters of Genesis. So Jesus had a very high view of the scriptures. 
So you can look at what the Bible says about our words, and it appears that God is very concerned about the words that we say, the words that we use. It's a huge topic in the Bible. In just one book of the Bible, the book of Proverbs, I counted 78 uses of the words mouth, tongue, or lips in the book of Proverbs. And then 68 references to bad types of speech, unwise words, or harsh words, or uh, wrong speech of one kind or another. And then 44 references to good types of speech, wise words, useful words. So you add all those up and that's something around maybe 175 references to speech and our words just in the book of Proverbs alone. Now, Proverbs probably has more than any other book, but it's a huge topic just for a couple of those as examples. Uh, Proverbs 17 verse 7 says, fine speech is not becoming to a fool still less is false speech to a prince or verse 27 and 28 in that same chapter whoever restrains his words has knowledge and he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding even a fool who keeps silent is considered wise when he closes his lips he is deemed intelligent now that that i think is supposed to strike us as funny um, I forget who it was. It said better to keep your mouth shut and have people wonder whether you're a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. I th that sounds like a Mark Twain or something like that. Um, but there are lots of examples of those types of verses in the book of Proverbs. I remember when I was a young, a young Christian new to the faith, and that for me was in um, high school. And really reading the Bible, even though I was brought up in church, we didn't do much Bible. And I remember reading the Bible really with new eyes and many ways for the first time, passages of the Bible that I had never really been aware of and just being sort of shocked at how much emphasis there was on our words and our speech. And it was a real uh, wake up call to me because I was already getting pretty sloppy in my speech, not in front of my parents, of course, but but around the kids at school. So that's sort of point number one is God obviously cares about our words. If we take scripture as the word of God, many, many Bible verses and passages about that. Then second is a reason for that. It's not just an outward thing. The reason God takes our words very seriously in our speech is because really, if you think about it, our words are a reflection of what's in our hearts. Uh, Jesus taught this himself in the New Testament in Matthew chapter 12. He was talking to a group of leaders who were in the process of rejecting him and trying to plot how they could kill him. And he said to this group of uh, scribes and Pharisees, he said, either make the tree good and its fruit good or make the tree bad and its fruit bad for the tree is known by its fruit. And then he says, you brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you're evil? And here's the phrase that jumped out at me when I was a young Christian. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good. And the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you. On the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words, you will be justified, and by your words, you will be condemned. I remember reading that verse also, or hearing someone mention it for the first time, the idea that I would give an account for all the, the careless words that I speak. I had just never thought about that before. I was, it, it really struck me, and I be, I began to realize just how important this is from a biblical point of view. A third principle I, I think we could remember, remember or that I would mention before we go into the specifics is just because this is so important and because God takes our words so seriously and because Jesus even said 
You're going to give an account for every careless word that you speak. And by your words, you'll be justified. By your words, you'll be condemned. I think it's prudent to say that we should err on the side of caution. In other words, if in doubt, don't. Some of these things, some of the words that are taboo, you could debate. And some can be used appropriately in some circumstances. It, I think this is also a cultural thing. And so some words that may mean something in one part of the world, the same word, even in English speaking countries, for example, could be considered um, out of bounds in one culture or in one time period and not later on, or the usage of the words changes over time. So there, there are some gray areas here and we don't want to get legalistic about it. But my general philosophy is if, if I'm in doubt about something, then I, I just, I don't, I won't use those words. One, uh, rather humorous example of this is uh i was when i grew up the word piss was a word that we were not allowed to use in our family it was and it was not anything you ever heard a nice person <laughs> say you certainly didn't hear it uh, in church at least in our church and uh imagine my surprise when i was reading the King James Bible one day and it was talking about males describing males as those that piss against the wall. And I was really blown away by that. I just thought, what? So here's this crass word. And I realized that it didn't used to be thought of in that way. And it had sort of become a crass or a vulgarity over time. I would still say in my situation, I didn't, I shouldn't use that word uh, or in polite company. But that's the one example of a word that has changed over time. And it was sort of shocking to, <laughs> to find that out. Uh, I also remember one time, my dad was a veterinarian. And uh, you'll know what other word I'm, I'm talking about when I say this. But there were other, there were other uh, words that we weren't supposed to say or uh, in, insults that we were not supposed to level at people. And one of, one of those is euphemistically referred to as SOB. And that B word in particular was, was, that was one of those words that we weren't supposed to say. It was considered a bad word. And then I heard my dad uh, talking with one of his veter veterinary clients on the phone one time. Somebody had called him at our house and he was describing something or trying to help them over the phone. I think, I think she was about to deliver puppies. And he said something like, well, so just make sure that you, the bitch does this and the bitch does that. And, uh, and it, I literally felt like somebody had shot me with a BB gun or something <laughs> to think my dad was talking like that. And then I realized, oh, okay. So he's talking about a mother dog, which is the real definition of the word bitch. But it's just that every time I had ever heard it, it wasn't used in that context. It was, it was calling someone uh, that a female uh, or calling someone a son of a bitch. And it was an insult word. And that's why it was considered uh, a taboo type of word. So we all have to use our judgment and we all have to stand before God individually. And, but he knows our hearts. And one of my cautions is to err on the side of, of caution. That's just something that I think that does flow from these principles. Romans 14 talks about that. It, it talks about um, whatsoever is not of faith is sin in Romans 14. Uh, it's, it's discussing those who had a clear conscience to eat certain foods and others who did not have a clear conscience about eating those certain foods. And it says that people could be persuaded in their own minds on these things. But really, if you didn't have a clear conscience about it, you shouldn't do it. Because, Paul said in Romans 14, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So that's a good reminder as well. And with those three big points, uh, I can jump into now some of the more specifics if you want, or if you have any questions or comments. Yeah, more. I'm more interested to see like the overview of the the different categories that you've got, and then some of the specifics for each one. So, um, what what was the first one that you mentioned? Was it profanity? Well, the actual the actual curse words, I think, are probably the best place to start because in my 
understanding if you were going to put these in a hierarchy these would be at the top or near the top of the list as the most serious and there's there's a reason why these are called curse words because that is literally what they are this this narrow set of words are actually pronouncing a curse or wishing for a curse to fall on someone um I looked up the definition of the word curse and a couple of definitions are to utter a wish of evil against someone or to call for mischief or injury to fall upon someone and to utter imprecations to affirm or deny with imprecations of divine vengeance. So the word damn itself actually means it's a synonym for curse. So to damn someone is to curse someone. Now, we, we would say that just saying this doesn't actually call down a curse on them. But it, at some level, for someone to say, damn you, or to use God's name in front of that, and for, call to God, for God to damn someone, uh, whether the person really means it or whether he's just ticked off at somebody, still, that's, that's what the words mean. And I think the reason this is at the top of the list of, of words that we should not casually say is because ultimately only God has the final authority to do that to someone, to damn someone or to curse someone. And it's a very serious thing. It's an, it's an eternally significant thing if God does that to someone. So we don't have, as humans, we don't have the right to do that. We don't have the right to curse someone, to damn someone. Uh, another very common phrase is to tell someone to go to hell. Think about that. And again, speaking as a Christian who really believes there is a hell, really believes there is a final judgment, really believes the things that Jesus said um, about what the afterlife would look like for someone who has been condemned to hell. It's not something to joke about, and it's not something to use lightly. And so that puts a whole category of those words, like asking God to damn someone or just using the, the phrase, you know, GD, we abbreviate it, telling someone to go to hell. To do this illegitimately or apart from God's explicit permission is really to put yourself in the place of God. Sometimes God gave his prophets the message to take a message of judgment to a group of people, an entire nation, or a group of people within the nation of Israel. And the same with the apostles in the New Testament. Paul said, for example, if anyone were to preach a different gospel than the one he had preached, the one that God had revealed to him, then that person would be condemned. He said, let him be anathema, which is similar to the idea of being cursed. But you have apostolic, he had apostolic authority to do that and had received revelation from God to that effect. But just to casually get mad at somebody on the highway or whatever situation and use GD or telling someone to go to hell or damn this and damn that, it's really quite, a, quite an audacious thing to do. Of course, if you don't really believe in God and you don't really believe in anything like hell, then you might say, well, so it doesn't really matter. But it's interesting, though, that people still use those words, <laughs> even though they would say, well, no, I don't really believe it. That's why I use it. Well, if you don't believe in, in hell, then why is telling someone to go to hell so bad? Right. It would be so like, saying, why does nobody say, ah, go ride a unicorn? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But yeah, a even atheists will say, they'll, they'll invoke God. They'll say, God, do this. God, do that. Yeah. So I really view it as a very audacious thing for a human being to do, to put oneself in the place of God. And think about the times when you hear this used in a lot of cases. It's some casual situation. So you you get up in the middle of the night, you walk around the corner of the bed, you kick, kick the bedpost with your little toe, and that hurts like the dickens. Uh, now, see, notice I use the word Dickens. We, we have euphemisms. We could talk about that some other time because <laughs> everybody knows what that stands for. But we say it hurts like the Dickens. But think about that. And you're telling somebody about it the next day. And yet you say, yeah, I was walking around the bed and I kicked the GD bedpost. Now, 
stop and think about that. So you think your little toe is so important that that you have the right to talk about the GD bedpost, which in one sense makes no sense, but in the, another sense, it just shows that this really is like, how dare that bedpost hurt my little toe? And I'm so mad at that bedpost and that a fact that I don't deserve to have my little toe hurting, I'm going to ask God to damn the bedpost. It makes no sense whatsoever. Just even the spirit of making no sense, it's like the attitude is there. Yeah. To the point yeah. of, I'm going to curse anything and everything, whether it makes any sense or not. That's my attitude. Right. Because I don't like it, is is the idea. Because I have the right not to hurt my little toe on the bedpost at night. Also, I regard the casual use of the word hell as a curse word that we should not use. How could anyone who takes hell seriously? And again, I, I'm not real fond of the idea of hell. Um, I believe in hell because Jesus Christ believed in hell. Jesus talked more about hell than anyone else in the Bible, as far as I can tell. And, you know, if I'm in doubt, I'm going to hide behind Christ. And he believed that there is an afterlife. He believed that there is eternal judgment. So why would I want to casually talk about hell this and hell that and what the hell? Maybe subconsciously it's a way of making ourselves feel better about these things, or maybe that they're not really there, or it's really not that serious to talk about something being damned or someone being damned or hell, someone going to hell. So those are probably the, the main words that I would say fall into the category of actual curse words. And there's a reason why we shouldn't do that, because no human being has the right to do that. Wouldn't that fall into the category of blasphemy? Because you're putting yourself in God's place. Um, I read that blasphemy is the idea of piercing a hole in something or defaming it. So it's when you're putting yourself in God's place or above God, you're bringing God down to your level and, and defaming it and devaluing it. Just the same way, like Jesus said, uh, or the Pharisees said, this man blasphemes because nobody can forgive sins but God. Well, right. like you said, nobody can curse anyone or to send anyone to hell but God. So to say that, you're putting yourself in his authority. So that's the Apostle Paul talked about. He would excommunicate men for saying things like that. It was, sorry, you're you're now out of the, out of the body. Right. And we don't yeah, take it that know, seriously. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, there is some overlap. And honestly, I should do some more study and try to ma nail some of these down more specifically. Like, what is the difference between cursing? Or is there a difference between cursing God and blaspheming God? Or are, the, are those just synonyms? Just on a popular level, I think of blasphemy as more related to the name of God himself, uh, blaspheming God, uh, God's name. But in the example that you just gave about uh, Jesus claiming to be able to forgive sins and that the Jewish leaders took that as blasphemy, now that's a really good argument. It doesn't have to have to do directly with the name of God. Claiming something that only God could claim was considered by them to be blasphemous. So that's, yeah, that's a good point. And at some point, I, I guess it would be blasphemy to put yourself in the place of God uh, and using these these curse words. So Yeah, a lot of it's it, about context, because we would never think of the words, your sins are forgiven, as a curse word. Right. Yeah, but that's a really good case. I, I, honestly, I've never gone and looked at every use of the word blasphemy in the Bible. That would be, that really should be a part of my book if I ever write it to make sure I know what blasphemy is. So yeah, that's a really good point. And that's kind of another another category. A second group of words are ones that I would call profanities. So you could utter a profanity that's not actually a curse word if you want to parse it very finely. But the word profane, to profane something, means to treat it, treat something that is sacred with irreverence or with contempt or, or with abuse. For example, to profane a sanctuary in the Old Testament, uh, in the Old Testament temple, 
to profane the sanctuary was to bring something into that sanctuary, which the Jews saw and Christians see as well as, as uh, a place where God made his presence known in a, some sort of a concentrated way. It's not like you can box God up in a building, but he did make himself known and manifest himself in a, in a supernatural way in, in the temple. So to bring for a priest, for example, a Jewish priest to go into the temple without having performed the cleansings and rituals that were associated with, with making himself fit to go into the temple would have, would have, he would have been said to be profaning the temple is treating something that we should revere and honor as sacred with irreverence and dishonor and abuse and contempt. So things like this, uh, I would say using the name of Jesus as an, as a curse word, again, going back to the bedpost, maybe instead of uh, using GD, you know, talking about the GD bedpost, somebody kicks the bedpost and, and just utters Jesus Christ like an epithet, like a curse word. And you can tell by the way that it's said, it's not just a mild thing. It's, it's, you could put in other curse words in there or other, other vulgarities. And you can tell by the way that it's said that it's meant to be like a curse word. So to take the name of Jesus Christ, the son of God who came to be the savior of the world, the one who came to bring us truth and light. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And to use his name like an excl exclamation or like a curse word out of anger or frustration or whatever. Uh, I would say that is treating something sacred with irreverence or contempt or abuse. That, that falls into the category of profanity. Now, you might also say that it, it's, uh, it's a blasphemy as well taking the Lord's name in vain. That's one of the 10 commandments. Um, again, I think taking the Lord's name in vain, I used to think of that exclusively in what you said, words that you said. Um, I, I believe now that taking the Lord's name in vain can be done in a lot of ways that don't directly involve saying his name. But certainly I think it includes the idea of using the name of God in an irreverent manner, taking the sacred, holy name of God, the God who created us, the God who gives us life, God who blesses us with so many good things, and to use his name like a curse word, uh, that is treating something sacred as if it's a common common thing, treating it irreverently. Yeah, I think, tend to think of doing something in vain is like doing it for nothing. So, you know, right. if somebody dies in vain, it means they died for nothing. So to take God's name in vain would be to put God's name somewhere that it has no purpose. That can include yeah. ourselves. So to call yourself by his name when you're not one of his people, that would be an example of taking his name in vain. Or also just saying his name when there's no purpose for it. Like you stub your toe and with no context or anything whatsoever, you just say his name. And right. th it's like, that was for nothing. You just invoked his name for no reason. Yeah, I remember in the movie... Um... Princess Bride, the little boy, I can't remember his name, uh, but his grandpa is reading him the story. And I don't remember the exact context, but to the boy. Yeah, he was trying to. The story is. He was asking if Humperdinck down. was going to die or not. Right. And he says, right. no, Humperdinck doesn't die. Yeah. And the boy uses the name of Jesus. Uh, Jesus, grandpa something like, when are we going to get to the, does he die or does he not? Some, something like that. And I remember um, there are lots of funny parts in that movie and, and it has a lot of good, uh, good points to it. But I remember watching that movie and thinking, now, why would the script writers, because the, the actor, Fred Savage, didn't really say that. The script writers thought about that very carefully and put that in the script and put that in the mouth of this probably 11 year old boy to use the name of Jesus. Why? Why? What purpose did it serve? Um, I don't think we should use the name of Jesus in a casual way like that. So most people, when they see that movie and see that scene, it's sort of presented as funny, humorous, 
Uh, and they don't see that as a profanity, but I would say it falls in that, in that category. Why would you want to use the name of Jesus in that way? Yeah, he says it more of a, as an exasperated way. Right. But he's sort of like, you could interpret that as like, Jesus, give me strength or something like that. But even still, that's getting into like, you know, he's speaking dishonorably to his grandpa at the very least by using right. Jesus's name there in that attitude. Right. I kind of debated on where to put this next category of words, but I, I think I would still say that these qualify as profanities because if you take, take the word profane, prof, to profane something means to treat it, tr- treat something sacred with contempt or irreverence. Uh, I would say that some of the words that we use to speak of sexual intercourse and what God designed to be a holy act, a wonderful, blessed act between a man and woman who have entered into a lifelong covenant with each other. Um, that is the context in the Bible. That, that's the only legitimate context for sexual intercourse. And yet, if you think about some of the words that we have used over the centuries to describe that act, uh, the F word comes to mind. There are others that you could probably think of, but think about the way that that word has become so common. Uh, that's, that used to be one of the biggest taboos. And I think with good reason. Now, some people scoff at this. George Carlin, the comedian, made his whole career out of the seven words that, that you're not supposed to say. And people used to just laugh uproariously about how stupid it was to have these words that you're not supposed to say and that the, and that the television censors would bleep or not even let get on even close to coming on the air. But think about taking, taking an act that is supposed to be an act of commitment, an act of self-giving, an act of um, vulnerability, between a man and a woman who have committed themselves before God and before witnesses till death do they part and all that goes into the Christian view of marriage. And now you come up with a word for that act between those two people, the sexual act. Not to mention becomes, that, that every human is alive due to the fact that their parents took part in this. That's right. That's right. And to take that word and to... I've always thought that was a really, really ugly word. Now I realize again, there's, there's part of that is just what it's associated with for, for me. Um, but why would you ever want to have a word like that and then, and use it then in all kinds of other contexts that have nothing to do with the sexual act? It seems to me to be taking something that was meant to be beautiful and yes, sacred, and just dragging it through the dirt and using it to describe any kind of sexual relationship. Uh, or even if you're not dragging it through the dirt, just to make it common and put it out in the open. Right. Yeah. Um, those, those words, I, I think there are a lot of words that sort of fall into that category of taking something that is supposed to be holy and sacred and special and just turning it into a crass vulgarity. Um, I think we should speak of these things in a more circumspect way because they are so, um, such weighty, weighty things and such wonderful things and things that were designed to be beautiful. I would never think of that word in connection with the relationship that I have with my wife. That absolutely should never describe never be used to describe the relationship between a husband and a wife our relationship is much richer than that much deeper than that much more sacred and special than that so i would put some of those types of words into a category profanity also because you're treating something that's supposed to be sacred with irreverence and contempt i remember uh, i was probably 
in the fifth grade when I first encountered that word. And it was scratched on the wall in a bathroom stall. So think about that. I don't know what, it, what is the deal with when people go into bathroom stalls, their minds tend to go to, to crudities and vulgarities and even just to the earthiness of what happens in the bathroom stall. But you think about a relationship between a husband and wife that is a great blessing, as you said, Adam, is, is where we all came from. Every single one of us had a sexual act to bring us into existence. And we reduce it to a four-letter word that we scratch with a, how do they do that? I always wonder what they use <laughs> scratch on those bathroom walls. We reduce it to something you scratch on the wall of the bathroom stall. With your car really. keys or a pocket knife. Yeah, maybe that's it. Yeah, car keys. That's probably, that's probably it. Like you said, the the act of taking something that was the foundation for your life and then making it number one, a, a coarse, dirty word, and then making that common and then putting it everywhere. So it's like, if you wanted to say love this and love that, and you know, um, I took the, the ever loving, you know, whatever, but we don't use the word love just as a, a, a flavor word or a seasoning word or something like that. Why is it that the only seasoning words people think of are, they tend to be vulgarities of something right. that was created to be good, but then you corrupt it and then you put it everywhere. Right. Yeah. It just really, the, the, whole... the heart behind that, the spirit behind that is just, and then the older I get, the more people I encounter who they've just never thought of why they do that. Right. I think in one sense, we give them too much credit for the spirit behind it. And a lot of it's not, they never thought about doing that. That's just the way that they heard people talk. And then they, they talk the same way. They don't think anything of it, but that's part of what's supposed to characterize uh, an intelligent person's life is that they think about why they do what they do and they don't just right. do it because everybody else does it without thinking about it. Yeah. And as far as I can tell, most people are doing it more because most people are doing it more. We're, we're seeing a downward, we're seeing a real, a real change in this regard. And I don't, I don't see it as liberation. I don't see it as being, uh, being released from these stupid Elizabethan taboos of the past. Maybe there's some of that. And again, you could, you could say there are some, some things where we've gone too far overboard on it, but uh, I don't regard the loosening and the coarsening of our national speech in everywhere in the media, things on television, things that you never used to see in print. Uh, I don't see that as a positive. I see it as a very sad, very negative, negative thing. Right. Well, I mean, and we should be striving to be as upstanding in our speech as possible instead of if, yeah, if you want to argue that, okay, this is not technically blasphemy. You're asking for God to to send this person to hell. You're not saying it that you're sending them to hell yourself, but it's like, why do you want to tiptoe the line with something that people were put to death for in the Bible right. or right. excommunicated for? Why do you want to get as close as you possibly can and say, I didn't do it on a technicality. Right. That's the wrong, right. that's the wrong attitude. It's like, oh, I didn't, I didn't put, stab the knife in. I just sort of scratched him a little bit. I didn't actually do it, uh, but I made him think I was, and then just stopped right before. Um, another thing you said about, um, why ten people tend to think about it as a, a liberation, that's been probably my widest encounter with it is why some people, they just start using certain words in one sense, I think to, to weed out people who are prudish, uh, in, in their words, it's, they don't want to be around prudes and they'll do it to sort of test the waters like everybody's cool if i say this right nobody's going to get offended nobody here's easily offended and i don't really know what the spirit behind that is there's a there's a famous um business owner his name's gary vaynerchuk and people come up to him all the time he uses the f word just constantly 
And people constantly come up to him and they say, what you're saying is so good and so important and so needed. Why are you turning all of these people off from ever listening to a single word that you have to say that they should hear? And he says, I don't care if they don't want to listen to me. There are enough that will listen to me that I just don't care. I really don't care about making my audience any wider. And he has, because he already does have a very wide audience. And he's like, this is just who I am. I just say these words. They don't mean anything. Yeah. And so it's a, it's like, if it doesn't mean anything, then why not change? Like you've exactly. changed in so many other areas to be a wealthy business owner. Um, he tells a story about how he used to run a wine shop as a kid. And he was playing around with different marketing things to try to figure out how to sell more wine. And so, you know, you'd walk in the door, a lot of people, they walk in the door of a wine shop and they don't know what to get. And wine is very subjective. And so when people would walk in, he just set up a, a, a row and it just said top 10. It didn't say top 10 wines. It gave no context for anything. <laughs> and just the number one wine, just whatever he put there, he could change it at any time. Whatever was in that number one slot would just fly off the shelves. And so you know he's able to think in terms of people do this because they don't want to have to learn about it. They don't want to reason through it. They're doing it based on emotional cues that I'm giving them. And people buy based off of emotions. And I have to understand the reason why they're coming into my wine store to buy this stuff. Right. They don't right. want to be sit down and, you know, given a five-hour lesson on how to be a good wine taster or how to tell different things and what the year, what's the difference between a Sauvignon Blanc or a Merlot. They, they don't care about any of that stuff. So he's capable of adjusting his thinking in order to make more money. But then all of a sudden, when it comes to using the F word constantly... He's just like, this is who I am. I just don't feel like changing this part. Well, right. why, how come you can change on everything else and not this? Why is this your stake in the ground when it's so severely limiting your audience? It's just a very strange, inconsistent thought process. Yeah. And, and there you see a little bit of the autonomy. It, basically, nobody tells me what to do. That's the spirit behind it. I, I'm going to say what I blankety blank blank feel like saying. And I don't give a blankety blank blank how anybody thinks, how anybody else feels about it. That is the cry of, of the unregenerate human heart saying, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. I am autonomous. No one, including God, including Christian civilization, no one tells me what to do. And it's, that really sort of says it all. It's so funny that that's like the core of his identity is using the F word in for, yeah. for no reason whatsoever. So we've talked about curse words. We talked about profanities, uh, taking something sacred and, and making it common or, or treating it with irreverence or contempt. Another category I would call just vul vulgarities. Now these, I think you re re really shouldn't technically call them cuss words. They're not cursing the way it is when you, T tell God to damn someone. But it is interesting that a lot of the, the words that we are quote unquote not supposed to say had to do with uh, excrement, different types of bodily functions involving sex or involving excrement. Now, this can sometimes be a hard line to draw because we all have ways of referring to things and we don't always use the totally perfect uh, anatomically correct terminology. Think about when you're teaching a little child to go to the bathroom. Nobody, nobody thinks that, uh, oh, you know, did you poop in your diaper? Nobody thinks of that as, as a parent um, cursing or really even using a vulgarity. Got to have some way to talk about it. I guess you could just say, did you go in your diaper? But but poop and pee, you know, those have pretty well become uh, understood as those are not considered considered vulgarities. Although you don't want to hear a sermon laced with that or hear uh, you're not going to hear, hear that in the halls of Congress on the floor of the House of Representatives or something like that. But, you know, there's the S word and there are other words that are used. Uh, for those types of things. And something that I've always thought of there is even if those are not technically 
technically curse words. Why, why do you want to pepper your speech with, with words for what comes out of your body when you, and goes down the toilet when you flush it? What, what is the fascination for those types of things, for human waste? Think about it. It's, it's, these are not lofty thoughts. These are earthy at the very best to be the, the most kind. You could just say they're, they're earthy and, uh, and sort of common words. But these are things that no one wants to touch. No one wants to. Everybody knows that, there's, that it's, this is filthiness. That's why you want it to go down the toilet and not handle it and not have it in your house. Uh, that's why they used to at least do it outside the house, even before they had a toilet that you could flush it, flush it down. Um, it strikes me as infantile, you know, little children who are learning how to use the bathroom, for example, they get very obsessed with what, what happens or what's happening with their bodies and what happens in the bathroom and all those sorts of things. So I think this whole category strikes me as just infantile. I think that's a good way to describe it. And why? Would you want to fill your mouth with those kinds of words? Don't you have any higher thoughts than that? Don't you have any loftier thoughts to think about? Uh, again, hard to draw lines sometimes, but, um, but there are reasons why those types of words are considered cuss words or words that you don't say when you're in, at least in polite company. Also, I would say, um, Slang words for body parts. Again, there's some fine lines here and different, even families might differ on some of these. But um, there are some that are particularly um, offensive, I believe. Again, going back to the sexual body parts. A lot of it to think, me also just smacks of how, how come it's it's a very narrow set yeah. of, of dirty words too. Like why isn't the word sludge or snot or... Like, why don't those carry the same weight? And I think it's yeah. because those other words have been used with the intent of being dirty and they just don't come up or, or they're the ones that always come up. So you know what the intent is behind them. The intent is not to be descriptive or to really serve in any way. And that's the biggest thing to me. Like you said, there's ways to refer to things that serve the, the context of the conversation. Like the right. way you would say something to a toddler would be different if you would, you know, if you were having to refer to something in front of the president of the United States or a senator or, or, or something like that. It's the context, it's the company, it's the setting, it's, okay, why are we talking about this? What needs to be done about it, if anything? And are you just saying this because you're not thinking about it? And that's, that to me, just the fact that there are so few words also lends itself to the idea that people just aren't thinking about what they're saying. They do yeah. it because it's common and they like the flippant, nobody can tell me what to do on my own man sort of attitude. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there also seems to be something specific about the sexual words. Like you said, snot. Now, that's not a pleasant word, but nobody thinks of that as a cuss word. But for example, think about the P word related to a woman's uh, anatomy. And once again, would a husband or should a husband ever refer, ever use that word referring to his wife? It, it's, it's a degrading, demeaning, reducing a woman to a body part. And it's even used that way by men. You know, I'm going to go get me some. Think about that. I'm not looking for a, wo a woman, for a wife that I can love and cherish and protect and provide for and parent children with. No, I'm, I'm going to go get me some. It is incredibly degrading to women. And women, are, they object to the use of those words. And the C word also is another one that's just particularly just so degrading and demeaning. It's fascinating, really, to think about it is ultimately a rejection of God's authority. It's, it's a demeaning of women. It's a defilement of marriage or a degrading of marriage, profaning of marriage, and all that is supposed to be sacred about that. So 
that whole category of vulgarities is a, is a whole separate thing that you can think about there. And not that there's never even a way to use those properly. Um, in the New Testament, where Paul's talking about the men who were the party of the circumcision, there was one point where Paul said, I wish that the men who insist on circumcision would castrate themselves. Right. But he's not doing that in a, he's perfectly justified. It's in that sense, it's an insult, but it's a justified insult because he's wanting to, he does want to shock them with the seriousness of what they're doing. Right. Yeah. And I don't, I don't think that word that he used that whatever the Greek word is for castration, I don't think that would have fallen in the category of some of these other words that we're talking about. I think it's probably the common word that was used for, for how someone was made a eunuch or Right. Something like that. But if I were now, to go would... to say somebody, if I just got angry at somebody and I went out and I told them to do that to themselves. Right. No, whatever lofty or unlofty word, vocabulary word that I use, the attitude behind it is wrong. wrong. It's an insult. Yes. It's, it's a, it's a, it's cursing somebody. It's wishing evil on someone. Yeah. Yeah. But exactly. Paul was doing, Paul was wishing evil on someone because they were being evil, trying to warn them. Yeah. Exactly. And and of uh, perverting the gospel through which we are brought into a right relationship with God. That's about the most serious sin that you can think of. So yeah, very different context there. So the final category that I would offer is one that I just call insult words. And it's interesting how many, how many of the words that we consider cuss words uh, fall into this category. And, and there's quite a few of them, actually. Calling someone an SOB, a uh, son of a bitch, think about that. So you are you are impugning his origins, <laughs> and, and you're saying his mother, it, it's, all, it's insulting not just the person, but it's insulting the mother of the person, which that's really interesting to think about why. Why to insult someone do you bring the mother into it? Or another one is um, MF, the MF phrase. Uh, And that brings in several words there, but it's also an insult. It brings in a sexual word and then applies it to the person and saying, you're basically having an incestuous relationship with with your mother. Um, now I had somebody, um, explain this to me recently that I had never thought of or understood before. The reason that I found in some circles that that one is so common and it's also used as like a, a, an actual, it's not a curse. It's an, an endearing thing to call somebody in some contexts. And I had never thought about this before, but the reason for that is because this is something that's so far beyond what the vast, vast majority of people would ever do. It's still seen as like the most heinous thing that you can possibly do. Like beyond murder, be all, all this stuff. Even in um, the most backwards pagan cultures, they understand. Um, Paul talks about it. It's like a man, you know, in 1 Corinthians 5, a man's engaging in conduct that's not even tolerated among unbelievers. Right. Like adultery, okay. But this, no way. Um, and the reason that it's an endearing thing or such a common thing for people to call each other is because, yeah, it's an insult, but you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt that it's not true. And so you can take comfort that at least the person that you're talking to is not engaging in this. So it's an insult that everybody is, it's understood that nobody's actually guilty of this. So to insult somebody from this actually gives them comforts to say that, well, at least I haven't done this. <laughs> and that was fascinating to me. Yeah. Now, I don't know. That seems pretty weak to me. That That's like nobody is nobody is actually a son of a bitch either. But that doesn't mean that right. that's a good thing to call <laughs> to call somebody. Right. People so get super know. insulted about that one. But then you call somebody an MF and they're like, oh, man, like, I know you love me, you know. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's it's really weird when you think that it's it's also implied to inanimate objects or to an, an, animals, you know, like somebody telling about the big fish that he caught, you know, I and I pulled in this big M effort and got him in the boat. And he, think about calling a fish 
an EMF. It, well, it makes no sense whatsoever. It's like asking God to damn the bedpost. Well, no, God's not going to damn bedposts. So it's a frivolous use of the word. It's a nonsensical use of the word. But why? Why? Why do people feel compelled when they're telling about the fish they caught? Why are they compelled to use those kinds of words? Honestly, I think in a lot of cases, it's just because I can. Because I can. Because if I want to, I'm going to use it. And I'll use whatever blankety blank words I choose to use. So there again, you see that uh, raising a fist at God, so to speak, with the words that we that we choose and they treat it um, they treat it so differently differently like if you if i was to go up to somebody and i would say hey you got some boogers hanging out of your nose yeah people would go oh man i'm, I'm so sorry about that let me you know give me a tissue instead of saying like who who can you tell me what to do like I, if i want to have a booger hanging out of my nose then i'm going to have a booger hanging out of my nose yeah yeah um bastard is another one of those words that i think probably all of us first learned probably that we weren't supposed to say it and then later on learned that there is a real use there is a real definition of that term that's not necessarily bad king james um, uses it doesn't it yep yep um if you are without discipline then you are bastards and not sons i think that's hebrews uh 11 or somewhere in there talking about god, how god disciplines his children so there again it's a word that can be used properly but when when used as an insult isn't, isn't it interesting, again, you're calling into question the person's parentage. You're, you're saying he was an illegitimate child. In other words, he was born of parents who were not legitimately having a sexual relationship. So it's funny how many of these things go to the heart of who a person is, where he came from, his parents, and, uh, and they're, they're designed to be that kind of to deliver that kind of a wound or that kind of an insult. Um, you also have racial slurs. You think about the N word and, and other words that used to be used of various ethnic groups, uh, Italians or uh, Irishmen or Jews or whatever. Um, could someone in ignorance just use one of those words and not, not, know that it had a bad connotation i think that's probably true especially the n-word probably has a history like that it it came from the word negro which was which literally means black in spanish the word negro means black um, but in the south in particular it, it began to be said in certain in a certain way and came to be taken as a serious insult which it certainly was intended to be so i understand that uh, when i was a kid using the n-word of anybody under any circumstances would get your mouth washed out with soap and yes those of you who may not be old enough to know that parents used to actually do that yes i had my mouth washed out with soap uh, on a number of occasions for using some of these words which in one sense doesn't help because it's not that your mouth is physically dirty but the idea that was communicated was, no, you, you need to control your tongue and these words should not come out of your mouth. It was quite memorable. After it was all over, you could still taste that soap taste for, for sometimes days to come. So it was actually quite effective. Insulting racial names and nicknames of, of all kinds would fall into those kind of insult words. And there again, not the same thing as asking God to damn someone or send someone to hell. But think about it. What control did you have over your ethnic background? Um, so why do you have the right to speak in a disparaging way of a whole racial group or uh, comment on someone's parentage or whatever? Mm -hmm. When you had no control over the way you came into the world, you, you had no control over what race you were born into. And so once again, as with curse words, human beings don't have the right to do this to other human beings we're all sinners we're all equally in need of the grace of god and we don't have the right to go around insulting people just because we don't like them or because they uh, burned our hamburger at mcdonald's or whatever so those are kind of the four big categories curse words profanities vulgarities and insult words i need to go back and do some more study on um, 
on blasphemy and see exactly where that fits or if that's a whole different category. But uh, yeah, now obviously I didn't go into this much detail with my sixth graders, but I've had adults who used to be my students years ago come up to me years later and say that they still remembered that lesson in cosology. So I hope it did some good way back when. Especially with something like um, racial slurs and things like that. Um, there's some even that I wasn't aware of. Like I was just within the last few years made aware of like to gyp someone is short for, for gypsy. Yep. So it's like saying that, well, all Jews rip people off. And it's not because they were taught that is because that that's their blood. Yeah. And so their blood is filthy. Uh, the same thing, uh, you know, a lot of those things don't really make much sense. Like I have a brown beard. Why is calling someone a brown beard? Why doesn't that mean anything? Why is that not an insult? Right. Um, or, you know, even there's some slurs for Mexicans who swim across the Gulf of Mexico to get to the United States and there's a slur for them. Right. And so it's, you know, even if somebody did swim across there, but they're not Mexican, that slur wouldn't make any sense. So it, it has to do with their blood and their race, which is why they're that. Right. Remember Mr. Potter in uh, It's a Wonderful Life looks down his nose at the people that um, George Bailey is building these houses for in his housing development through the savings and loan, or what do they call it? The Not savings and loan. The building and loan. Building and loan. Uh, and, of course, Mr. Potter is supposed to be the despicable character in the story, and he certainly is, and he calls them garlic eaters. Um, to these probably um, Italians that were having these homes built. And so, yeah, some of those I grew up with and didn't think of them as, uh, as so bad. But then later on, years later, you realize, okay, something that may have been understandable in a certain context, like World War II, for example, um, doesn't mean that we should apply that word to all all people or even that we ever should have applied it. So, for example, during World War II, you, we talked about Japs for Japanese. And you might, you might say, well, that's just a shortened term for Japanese. But that was not the way that it was meant when, when kids that were growing up in not too many years past the, the Second World War, Second World War, uh, referred to someone as a Jap or uh, made fun of slanty eyes and that type of thing, or uh, Germans, you know, now Kraut is one that I've heard for, for Germans. I don't honestly know. Is that referring to sauerkraut? Uh, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about that in a long time. Uh, and is that, I would say that that was a, that was meant to be an insult when the Japanese certainly committed atrocities against us you can understand anger and and uh, a reaction a very strong reaction from the american population but it's generally not a good idea to just paint everybody with the same broad brush everybody of a certain ethnic group or a certain country i'm sure there were a lot of japanese people who didn't have any idea what their government was about to do and and as it turned out the way the war ended certainly wish their government had never ever done such a thing yeah, it's a fascinating topic, really. And it is kind of funny that you don't hear it gone into detail. So, Yeah, I think the biggest takeaway is that, like, you've heard little kids, they'll be polite and they'll say, like, oh, you know, so-and-so said the S word. Oh, what's the S word? You know, stupid. Or things like yeah, that. Yeah, that was you. That that actually came from you when you are a little boy. Do you remember that? Yeah. You yeah. actually I, said that. So it really has to do, and, and I think that's a good thing to do with young children before they're exposed to things. It's what is the intent? Stupid, calling someone stupid can be just as meant as, as is, I would say, just as sinful as calling someone an MF because it's an insult. It's the attitude, the heart attitude behind it. And in that sense, right. any word, you can say anything with a certain, ad, with any, with an attitude and it's the attitude behind it that makes that's that's the biggest deal. That's right. That's right. And that is important to to remember. And I think some people that's why they may bow up against some of these words because they think, well, I don't really mean anything by it. Uh, in some cases, that 
that may be true, but in other cases where the culture has decided for whatever reason, over whatever history, that these words are, are not to be used or they should be avoided, even if it's just in polite company. And to buck up against that automatically all the time, no matter what, is is an indication of an, of a hard attitude as well. So, and it's more. It's also showing just a general spirit of in cooperation with other people, right? Which is the wrong attitude to be showing in general. Just as a blanket rule, is I'm going to um, go out of my way to cause offense with, for no reason. It's like yeah. are, people people are actually tend to be really good at boxing themselves in. And not doing anything that needlessly offends somebody else in public, except when it comes to their words. It's, I think that that all just goes back to a lot of people, not all, but a lot of people just haven't thought about it. And it's just the way that it's done. And it's what comes natural. And But isn't it careless, isn't it funny that it's our words that we tend to be the most careless with, which are the most right. important. But then with our appearance, you know, make sure to comb your hair, make sure, you know, you don't have a hole in your pants. That would be yeah. way more taboo to somebody walking downtown <laughs> with a hole in their pants and their underwear showing through than, you know, using the F word. Yeah, and it, exactly. And it's like, it's a straining at gnats and swallowing camels. I would, I would much rather somebody be able to point to a hole in my pants, my underwear showing, than to say, you know, Adam's been calling you know, saying the N word everywhere and calling other people effers. Yeah. I have got a good scripture to close with. If, if, uh, if that's all right. Is it James? Well, I was thinking of Ephesians four. Okay. That's a good one too. Yeah. Uh, this is, uh, the apostle Paul giving instructions to believers in a church in the city of Ephesus. And so Ephesians chapter four, verses 29 through 32, he says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ, God forgave you. So that's a good, good word to end on. Yeah. I was also thinking of James where it just talks about the power of words where yeah. it likens the tongue to a rudder on a ship. Yeah. It's a small member, but it's the one that directs where your life is going to go. The same way the ship is directed, blown about by huge winds and, and it has sails and it's this huge vessel or a, a horse is controlled by the bit in its mouth. Right. And, it's the one thing that I think people give the least amount of thought to, and it's the one thing that controls their whole lives. Yeah, he also talks about the tongue as a fire, a flaming fire. Set on fire by uh, hell. Yeah, yeah, rather sobering. Think of. Well, thanks for this, Dad. Uh, I think this needs to be not necessarily talked about more, but needs to have a wider audience. I think so too. I appreciate the opportunity to come on with you. It was, it was great. Great uh, delving into this a little bit. Thanks dad.